If you look at a map of the Earth, the continents appear to fit together like a puzzle. We know today that the continents move on tectonic plates that slowly drift apart and crash together. Before 1966, however, continental drift was considered a fringe idea. A series of discoveries that year at what is now Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory changed everything. It started with data from a magnetometer towed behind the research ship El Tannen. A new prediction had just been made about how the plates carrying continents were formed at mid-ocean ridges. The age of the crust should increase away from the ridge. Magnetic anomalies were just starting to be used to date rocks. What Walter Pittman saw in the El Tannen data showed that seafloor was created at a mid-ocean ridge and then spread apart. This was the smoking gun of plate tectonics. The theory of the ideas of continental drift here in the late 1950s uh, was uh, a no-no at many of the universities. I wrote a term paper at college uh, and got a zero uh, explained to me for even picking the topic of continental drift. Uh, so when we arrived in graduate school here at Columbia, uh, drift was not uh, endorsed. Uh, there was a school of thought called eugeosynclinal theory, that mountains just went up and down, basins formed, and they squeezed up into mountains. So Walter and I arrived uh, with backgrounds in physics and engineering, which was helpful because we didn't know enough geology for it to get in the way. We had a marine magnetic department at Lamont, and one of my jobs was to just make sure that uh, the acquisition of the magnetic data you know, worked, that the magnetometers worked and so forth. Somewhere along there, uh, out from the data acquired on the, uh, by the Altanen, came this Altanen 19 profile, which was just perfectly symmetric with, with respect to the ridge axis. And uh, that was it, you know, it was a flash. <laughs> it was like being struck by lightning, and we had this magic key, this magic magnetic profile, which was perfectly symmetric with respect to the ridge axis, which is the line along which the separation of the plates was taking place, and that was it. We were able to date it and eventually use it not only as a tool to prove continental drift, but a, a, a tool by which we could actually uh, reconstruct the pattern of drift, that is the relative position of the continents, and the actual timing of the separation of the continents. Sykes, when he saw it, just took off. I mean, I th thought he was just going to jump right out the window. <laughs> He galloped on down the hill because what he had been doing, he had been looking at the, uh, using uh, seismic data to look at the first motion along faults. And the first motion tells you the relative direction that the rocks are moving across a fault. And he'd been looking at the ridge axes and at the, at the transform faults that offset the ridge axes. And so he just went galloping down the hill and he just pulled together these data. So the idea was that at these fracture zones, these zones of rough topography that had been discovered in the 1950s, they were offset like this, or there was an apparent offset. So the idea at that time was a simple offset that they had been formed together and subsequently offset. But Wilson realized, and I had data on this, that uh, the zone between these two uh, apparently offset ridges, uh, the earthquakes did not extend uh, off to either side. They ended abruptly right at the ridges. Uh, and in fact, then the sense of motion, if we have these two ridges like this, was in this direction. And it was exactly opposite that of simple offset. Uh, so it was a really good test. Uh, all I had to show from my earthquake mechanisms was that the sense of motion was along these uh, fracture zones, or what became known as transform faults, uh, and exactly opposite from simple offset.
and Wilson's ideas intimately involved seafloor spreading along the bridge segments. I was fortunate that there was a whole new set of worldwide data, uh, the data being seismic recordings of earthquakes and underground explosions, but I was looking at the earthquakes. And so Lamont was one of two places in the world that had a complete set of the film chips uh, that from 125 stations around the world. Marie Schilling had a policy that you collected all data that you could at all times, and that all of that data had to be uh, processed and stored in some kind of sensible, recoverable way. And there was no excuse. I mean, this, uh, whether you were going in or out of a port or out in the middle of the ocean, you acquired all the data you possibly could at all times. And that was the key to it, really. We had an enormous data set because of that policy. When C4 spreading erupted on the scene, we had the data. And we had the data that we could pull out of the computers just like that. We could just go right to the computer, right then and there, and say, OK, let's go look at the Pacific Ocean. So he also uh, instructed that the ship would stop at least once a day, preferably twice a day, to take a core, a, drive a pipe into the seabed and bring back 10, 15 meters of sediment to go into the core lab, which at that time was the former old garage of the Lamont family. We had about 3,000 cores by that time, didn't we? Right. So yeah. as the magnetic wiggles appear, confirming that the polarity shifts of the Earth's magnetic field were imprinting a signal on the sea floor of these shifts. Updike had in place by one of his graduate students, John Foster, a magnetometer, a, a device that um, uh, in which you could put rocks, little cylinders of, of, of hard rock, and measure the remembered magnetic signature. These used to be volcanic rocks, but we could also go to the core collection. The cores had dried out, so you could cut a little cylinder out of the sediment core. And Billy Glass, uh, one of the grad students, did that to a core off Antarctica and had a eureka experience like Walter's. The same pattern that was coming out on the seafloor was right there in the sediment cores. So if we knew the ages, wouldn't it have been field reversed? We had a new dating technique for all the sediment cores. You can understand why when you get hooked by a science, you, you, you become addicted, right? I mean, you just dive in. It's just, uh, it's, it's so incredible. I'm sure, I'm sure that every science has these kind of moments, you know, when you, uh, things click and they begin to work and you begin to be able to explain things and understand them. And you're like, gosh, you know. That's how it works.